Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode 34 of I Wish You Were Dead, a podcast about things that used to be alive. My name is Mike, and that is Gavin. Gavin, I have nothing to say other than last week's episode was awesome. It was. I really loved last week episode. Last week's episode, and I uh, think that we're going to really enjoy this week's episode as well because, for the second week in a row and second time ever, we actually have a guest on the podcast. Yeah, number one fan of the pod. You have heard us mention her name before. Fia is here. Fia, say hi to everybody. Hi guys. I'm excited to be here. We're excited to have you. <laughs> so. We are going to get back a little bit into our normal routine and start off with uh, this week in science uh, with, I guess, any extra commentary that Fia would like to add to it. And then we'll (laughs) let Fia sort of introduce herself and and what she does after we do that. So, since we have two people, do either of you have a year for me? Oh my gosh, I get to guess. (laughs) It's all you, Fia. All right. I feel strongly about 2017. Do you have an answer, Mike? 2008. No. Sorry. 2012. You always sound just so upset every time. (laughs) Because I'm really rooting for you. (laughs) (laughs) See, and at least you have... uh, It's still really bad, but you got one right. So you have a win win on your, you know... uh, We do know that it's possible. We know that it's possible, unlike Theo, who's so far batting zero. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so Mike, Mike is batting like point zero zero one, but it's not zero. <laughs> so this is uh, from August 2nd, so this past Monday, uh, if you're listening to this the day it comes out. From 2012, the headline says, Ancient rainforest detected beneath Antarctic ice. What? Hmm? What Again, kind of... With, with all of these just very bad and misleading <laughs> headlines. Because that makes it sound like there is a literal rainforest under the ice of Antarctica, right? Yeah. Spoilers, there's not. Um, <laughs> scientists drilling for samples near the Antarctic coast discovered evidence suggesting that a near-tropical rainforest existed there some 52 million years ago. That time should sound vaguely familiar to anybody who listened to our uh, Paleocene, Eocene, Thermal Maximum episode. It's only slightly after that event, about two or three million years after that happened. Using pollen recovered from sediment cores, scientists calculated that the forest may have been entirely blanketed uh, Antarctica's light uh, landscape for most of the Eocene period. It's an epic calendar. Learn your terminology. Um, (laughs) The formation of the continent's thick ice sheets has largely been attributed to a 60% decrease in the area's carbon dioxide levels beginning nearly 34 million years ago. Interesting. I got nothing. Okay. Yeah. And it's like, okay, I feel like we knew this much earlier than 2012, though. Oh, yeah? Not like much, but like we'd known how warm it was in the Eocene since like the early 2000s, if not, like, the mid to late 90s? Or at least had a decent idea of it. Our isotope technology has gotten a lot better since then. But, like, we've definitely known that it was real warm. Um, And so, mm, once again, Calendar, letting me down. I put so much faith in you. (laughs) And maybe one day you'll get a little better. But I'm not going to get my hopes up. Just so, like, I won't get my hopes up and Mike guessing the right answer again. Wow. Just, you're just throwing shade at me. <laughs> All right, so with so, that. Well, before we get started, let's go ahead. Oh. Unlike our uh, our wonderful guest last week, uh, Naseba Raja, Raja and um, Dr. Emma Dune, I apologize for my pronunciation as well as my <laughs> girlfriend's dog in the background. <laughs> um, but we've actually known Fia for years. So Fia, why don't yeah. you go ahead and introduce yourselves and, uh, and why are you here? Uh, okay, so my name is Fia. Uh, real name Fanella, I guess. Um, I'm from upstate New York. Uh, I know Gavin and Mike from Hobie, a leadership seminar that we all volunteer at. So I've known them probably for seven or eight. Yeah, getting close to 10 years now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're about to hit. We got to have like a decade party once we make it. (laughs) Um, But so I'm from upstate New York. I moved to 
Southern Louisiana in November of 2020. And uh, now I work as a research technician at the Louisiana Universities of Marine Consortium, uh, aka I will refer to this as LOMCON. Um, I work in a benthic ecology lab, which uh, benthic means bottom of a body of water. And ecology is the branch of biology that uh, deals with the relationships of organisms for, like, to one another in their physical environment. Um, my All current, right. yeah, my current like study system right now is oyster reefs. That's like my jam. And uh, specifically, I like to study community ecology. So I like to uh, look at the interactions between uh, the different organisms that live on oyster reefs, how they assemble and how they interact with each other, the environment and uh, the oysters. Interesting. So as, as we'll talk about throughout this episode, which I'm sure you know, you've know you probably seen the title uh, since you clicked on uh, this episode. Yeah, uh, what's the title of this episode going to be? We're going to be talking about reefs. Just reefs? Reefs. All right, perfect. In, in so that's general. the title of this episode. Yes, we're going to be talking about reefs in general because they are much more complex than you probably think they are. And they're not just corals, as Fia just alluded to. Mm-hmm. Um, so I had known that there were oyster reefs. I did not think that there were any in Louisiana. Oh, uh, they're different than what you think. So when I came down to Louisiana, I was imagining oyster reefs, these like huge giant mounds of structure and like Mm -hmm. being cool and like deep, but they're really just kind of like, uh, a plane of like one to two layers of oysters on a mudflat. And, uh, that's pretty much it. (laughs) Okay. Because but... obviously there are oyster reefs sort of up in like the northern Atlantic coast, not quite yeah. where we're from because we're not, none of us really live near the ocean, but more yeah. toward us. And I'd always sort of imagined them as like fairly large because you always hear about like, yeah. like, and I, I don't know if this is actually from oysters, but I always kind of assumed that like New England clam chowder was actually made from oysters because oysters are sort of clams. Um mm. I, I know, I know, they're not no. actually clams. No. They're, they're bivalves. We will, talk, we will talk about it. This is um, kind of like every time I say uh, <laughs> like anthropology instead of archaeology. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I know that oysters are not, uh, <clears throat> oysters are not clams. They are bivalves. Yes. But I just colloquially call bivalves clams, as most people probably do as well. And I know that that's not correct. Mm-hmm. But in yeah. this sense, especially with invertebrates, I am nearly as much of a lay person as Mike. Mm. I, I do not do anything with invertebrates almost ever. So this will be really interesting for me as well. Yeah. I so. am invert person. <laughs> so uh, let's sort of break down. We'll, we'll do things a little bit out of order for what we normally do. Normally, uh, as with most things in sort of geology, we start at the beginning and then work our way toward the present. But... Uh, because we're sort of highlighting you in this episode, oh. and uh, most people probably don't listen to an entire episode. Uh, I feel like very few people would skip the beginning and go to the end of an episode. So we want the people to hear you. So let's let's talk about it a little bit. So, sort of from like a biological sort of perspective, what even is a reef? Well, that's a great question, and I would first like to start off by asking Mike, what a reef is. This is how we know that Fia is a regular listener. <laughs> <laughs> we, we are doing things, unlike what Gavin said, we're doing things in the exact right order. We're embarrassing me right off the bat. And then <laughs> we're getting touched. What is a reef? Um, I don't have a clue. Um, so I'm assu- yeah, assuming it has to be underwater. I'm okay. assuming it has to be um, a place of unusually dense and specific um, life in this one particular place underwater. And Mm -hmm. I'm trying to be broad with that because I know, like (laughs) you guys just said, there's different kinds of life. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I'm already getting laughed at by Fia, so this is going great. No. Uh, But that's what I'm sticking with. So underwater and a place of unusually dense um, and specific kinds of life in that area. Okay. 
uh, you did pretty good. Did um, I? I think so. I, okay. I think it's the, the reason why we ask you these questions is because we want to get the baseline for like what the the average person who's not a scientist thinks about things. Yeah, it's really, and then all we, of and these, then we work about that with yeah. all of these. We've gone back, you know. Uh, several times now, but like the Supreme Court's definition of porn, like I kind of know it when I see it. Like I know it well, when it's like you know with, it's with reefs that can actually be kind of tricky because everybody imagines a coral reef, and it's yeah. like right. and and especially the coral reefs of the Pacific, which are very different than the ones in the Atlantic. Yeah. Um, oh. For for reasons oh, right. that we can we can touch on in a little bit, but yeah. Um. So it's like you might have seen a reef. I'm, I imagine. Anybody who lives anywhere, even near an ocean, even if you don't think that you live in a tropical area, you've seen a reef. Yeah. You probably just didn't realize that that's technically what that is. Yeah. All right. Well, then, you know, we had my definition. Let's go ahead. You know, what, what is a reef? All right. So the dictionary definition of what uh, a reef is, is a chain of rocks or coral or a ridge of sand at or near the surface of the water. And I don't know how much I particularly agree with that, (laughs) but I wasn't really able to find a clear answer about what requirements it is to be considered a reef. But um, I've heard from some of my colleagues that it has to meet specific geological requirements. Gavin, do you know anything about that? So from... Everything that I've seen, because, you know, like you said, it's it's tough to find a clear yeah. answer. The best way I've heard it described is just it's a pile of stuff because yeah. it can be literally anything. Um, yeah. It doesn't you know, have to it, be alive. It doesn't have to, like, right. be an organism. It doesn't even have to be technically naturally put there. True. Yep. So because so we'll, we'll go through some of the biological stuff and then I have some fun anecdotes. Cool. <laughs> so I guess in the realm of research that I work in, a reef is a term used more loosely um, and applied to more than just corals and rocks. Mm-hmm. And the definition really revolves more around like the structural aspects, specifically in terms of providing habitat for other organisms. So some reefs that I know of are coral reefs, um, oyster or bivalve reefs. Um, There's also glass sponge reefs and then um, algae or stromatolite reefs. Um, And those are all living reefs because they're organisms. And there's a term that I work with um, a lot. It's called foundation species. And uh, some people refer to it as, as keystone species, but I don't really... Foundation species is more broad. Uh, It's basically uh, an organism that provides habitat and um, alters the the physical conditions around them that provide um, positive effects on the diversity, the distribution, and abundance of all the organisms that depend on them. So a coral reef is like a perfect example of a foundation species. They provide habitat for a bunch of fish and inverts and a bunch of other things. Uh, and they contribute positively to those things. Um, a lot of scientists used to believe that foundation species and specifically reefs, um, they only contributed to their communities, uh, structurally but now a lot of people and this is a a big part of my research are starting to think that their biotic or living attributions are also providing positive effects on the communities too so things like uh filtration in oyster reefs um has positive effects on the communities around them and also like the fact that like coral and oysters are food sources Mm -hmm. for other organisms is like a a living attribution that they provide to their communities. Um, Absolutely. But in, in terms of reefs in general, there's also a whole other aspect that we have to consider like artificial reefs, which are things like (laughs) shipwrecks, abandoned oil platforms, anything man-made that we were like, 
oops, and then it's in the water now. <laughs> and it provided a habitat for some organism. Mm -hmm. um, the last thing I want to go over of reefs in general is like the services and functions um, to the ecosystem. So ecosystem services of reefs are things that um, provide services to humans, benefit us. And uh, reefs will provide coastal protection. So during major storm events, they decrease erosion and uh, any type of like damage to the coast, mm -hmm. or at least, uh, yeah, they decrease it. They don't like fully prevent it. Mm -hmm. um, they provide a home for bait fish and commercial fish. So like coral reefs will provide habitat for grouper, snapper, lobster, uh, the oyster reefs that I work with, um, blue crab, speckled trout, uh, redfish are really popular in, in the oyster reefs. Um, they're also food sources, oysters. Everybody yeah. likes oysters, I guess. Well, <laughs> not me. Not me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Mike, how do you feel about oysters as food? Uh, zero out of ten. Yeah. All right. Cool. Hard, it's, been been while, but it's been a while, but well, I have no interest in trying again. So. Yeah. I, I think that this may be partially a reason why I'm so like invertebrate averse. So yeah. in my um, invertebrate paleontology class in mm -hmm. uh, when I was still in, in undergrad, we our, our teacher sort of described the at least the lab part of the semester as a tiptoe through the phyla, you know, starting at the most basic invertebrates and working our way sort of, even though this is a very flawed way of thinking and he acknowledges that, but up the more like complex, more advanced, you know, quote unquote, uh, species. So starting with things like sponges and moving yep. all the way up through things like uh, arthropods and, and such. But mm -hmm. for the bivalve lab, especially because he was a clam specialist. Oh. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. We, he had us, uh, he cooked clams for us. And Interesting. Basically just to get us to look at their anatomy. Because uh, clams, you know, even cooked, maintain all of their organs in the proper way if you mm -hmm. can just sort of scoop them out of the shell, you know? Yeah. Um, so, and then basically, he didn't actually deduct anybody's grade, but sort of told us. He was like, you know, if you don't eat it, it might look badly on your lab. That's and mean. I, I know. And like, like he, he That's didn't a fun actually. Professor. He didn't actually, um, but so it was, um, and I, I, no, I did not eat it. No. <laughs> so. It wasn't uh, worth the bonus points? It was not. Not I don't even really close. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I have shucked and dissected way too many oysters to <laughs> ever even think about them as something I want to eat. And have you ever found any pearls? Yes. Oh my gosh. Yes. I found, um, I'm sorry. I'm so excited about this because <laughs> just like, I think two weeks ago, I found for, uh, the oysters that I work with, um, in Louisiana, the water here is really, really muddy. Mm -hmm. So most of the pearls are brown, black, like okay. muddy. <laughs> they look muddy. And, uh, just, like in my very last uh, sample that I was working with, I found this probably about the size of um, a really like puny pea. Like, okay. Like not a full pea, but it was, it was big. Er. Do you get to keep them or are they like the lab? Oh yeah. No finders keepers. <laughs> oh sweet. Yeah. So I found it and I wasn't sure at first because it was white and I was like, uh, this isn't normal at all. <laughs> and so I'm like going around asking everybody, hey, like, does this look like a pearl to you or is this fake? And then I finally looked under a microscope and you could see that it was mm. like uh, kind of shiny underneath and was like okay. chipping away. Like um, when you have like a little like chip on your fingernail, it like mm -hmm. you can like peel off a layer. It was like that. Oh, cool. Yeah. So uh, I found one and I'm very excited about it. <laughs> But, um, which is also another ecosystem service yeah. of oysters. Uh, they are an ec economic source for us mm -hmm. and also the fact that they're food too and are shipped around the world. 
Um, and then also they provide medicinal properties too. I know mm-hmm. that there's a lot of uh, research going into coral for medicine. And then uh, with um, oysters and sponges too, uh, water filtration is yeah. a big one. But in terms of the side that I like better of ecosystem, <laughs> uh, ecosystem functions, which is the uh, services provided to the ecosystem and the organisms that live on the reefs. Uh, there's uh, They attenuate wave energy and stabilize sediments. That's just mm. like a fancy That's term for massive. saying they like... They just calm the water and uh, they don't let things muck around as much. Mm -hmm. Um, They provide shelter, which is huge for like tiny little organisms like shrimp and crabs and amphipods, like all the little things. Uh, They provide food, like not just to us, but to other uh, critters in the sea. Uh, They also filter water, which can be good for... um, I guess things that need clear water to see like, um, like the corals themselves. Yeah, even. exactly. Yeah. Yeah. They, um, they definitely for, need for that. reasons that we will talk about. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, also primary production, just like being the base level of, of the food chain is, is really important to, uh, maintain diversity and mm-hmm. everything like that. And maybe I'll, maybe I'll come back to this, uh, once, we sort of go through the different types of modern reefs, mm-hmm. but I, I had a thought that I will come back to. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm, if I don't say it out loud, I will 100% forget. I so. get that. I get that. <laughs> um, but yeah, so sort of going from like the, the biological side to the geological side of reefs. I mean, you we kind of talked about it at the beginning where it's a reef technically is just like a pile of stuff. Mm-hmm. You know, examples of things that are reefs that you probably didn't think about are like the Outer Banks in North Carolina. Oh, yeah. That series of islands that looks like, it, it's so like conformable to the coast, it looks like it's fake. Yeah. It's, it's all just like sand, but technically <laughs> that is a reef. Wow. It is not biological. There's no coral or, or oysters or anything holding that sediment there, but that is technically a reef. Um, so when I was giving my layperson's definition of a reef, the idea that there has to be something living there, that that's not correct, right? I mean, there probably is something living in the sand there, yeah. just because it's, it's a near shore or, ocean. Um, but it's not a requirement for it to be a reef, correct? Right. That is correct. Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, but, but like you said, most examples of reefs, both today and also in the fossil record, are very much bound by uh, some kind of living organism. Gotcha. However, yeah. um, from the human perspective, because one that we're not going to talk about a lot when it comes to things forming reefs, because I'll, well, I'll talk about them here, is humans. Humans have been making reefs actually for quite a long time. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, there are lots of things people will just put out big, some uh, like cement blocks in the ocean yep. um, to help, you know, break waves, because that's, like, like Fia said, a really important service that reefs provide is that they make like big storm waves from like hurricanes and things, they really make that those waves less impactful uh, yeah. to the shore. Um, they do that a lot down mm-hmm. here in Louisiana. Like I've yeah. seen down by the beach uh, in Grand Isle, they just have like strips of just cement next mm-hmm. to the shore. And one particularly famous example of humans trying to make a reef and really screwing it up um, is in Florida – as Shocker. always happened. Uh, <laughs> so I think sometime in like the early to mid seventies, some genius down in Florida decided, Hey, we've got all these spare tires laying around. So they I tried making, they tried making a reef oh, out no. of old tires. And this is not an exaggeration. They put, more than 2 million tires off the Atlantic coast of Florida. And then what happened, Gavin? Well, the the rationale was, okay, if we put this here, because you can actually do this with cement reefs. You can, like, form the cement before you put it in the water in, like, specific ways for there to be, like, hidey spots for fish and things. And then eventually coral will come and colonize that or other kinds of colonial 
uh, you know, benthic, you know, bottom dwelling organisms, they will come and colonize that cement that you put there and then form a reef themselves. Uh, so they can be really successful. And there, there has been precedent of humans making reefs that then become very productive fishing grounds and things like that. So that's what they were trying to do was like, okay, tires are basically just a big hidey hole for fish and stuff to live in. So if we put the holes already there for them, the fish will come and then we'll have a great fishery area and things will be great. Narrator, things were not great. Um, (laughs) Because they did not test the corrosiveness of the uh, things that they used to bind all the tires together because they did tie all together. They didn't just dump 2 million tires in the ocean. Okay, that makes me feel a little better. That's what I was thinking. Yeah, they tried to bundle them together in like big bundles and get the end and two like weights to get them to stay on the bottom. Number one, I think they made them way too deep for them to actually be effective because they put them like more like I think where they put them, the ocean was like 60 feet deep. And I'm like, that is much (laughs) too deep for a reef. Yeah. You need light. Not, not just that, but like, unless you're talking about like a massive, like tsunami wave, it's not the wave energy is not going to get 60 feet down. True. True. And like the fish, I'm like, what are you, what are you trying to fish? down there (laughs) yeah um like this was such a massive deal that like they even dropped like a golden tire from a goodyear blimp that's how like as to like christen the new reef like that's how big of a deal this was at the time um but yeah they they didn't test the corrosiveness of like the because they used steel uh, i think to bind some of the tires together which obviously in ocean water rusted and corroded and freed all the tires and uh some big storms came and washed a ton of it away. Uh, you can find them in other countries, like tires mm. from this uh, giant useless. And reef. I hope they're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> they they got the military involved at some point. They use it as like well, no, they use it as like a training ground for like uh, Marines and and different Navy officers for like scuba diving in weird potentially dangerous conditions. <laughs> I'm sorry um, if you said this, but when did this happen? Uh, early 70s. Jeez. So uh, they kind of just ignored it for like 30 years. Oh, God. Uh, so, so so like in like the late 90s, to early 2000s, the Florida government decided to try and uh, actually throw some money at the problem to try and like, okay, this was a catastrophic failure. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Let's get some of these tires out of there. Um. Because not only did nothing really grow on them, but because they were no longer bound together, they move around a lot. So anything that tried to grow on them would just get destroyed. And then they also kept getting thrown into the actual coral reefs that were nearby, (laughs) destroying the coral reefs. So, Oh, dear. um, Do you know what side of Florida this was on? This was on the Atlantic side, not the Gulf side. Okay, okay. Uh, But yeah, so this is still very much a problem. Uh, They, I think so far, they've removed about a third of them. So there's still uh, like over a million tires just chilling off the coast of Florida right now. Are they uh, still in their designated location, or just they've oh they've gone completely wherever? spread? Like there, I mean, like I said, there's some that have been blown by storms to other countries. Like oh dear, yeah. So <sighs> good job, Florida. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> that was Florida. that was a much deeper anecdote that I wanted to get into, but. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so humans also are significant reef builders, even if we're not very good at it. Uh, mm-hmm. We've been doing it for quite a while. Uh, yeah. So, a lot of shipwrecks uh, mm-hmm. down in like the Caribbean have been like huge uh, reefs for. So I meant to ask of... this earlier when you brought this up, but my girlfriend's dog was barking. Mm. <laughs> um, so, like the human caused reefs, obviously, you know, the Florida variety, like you mentioned, Gavin, probably aren't that great, but. Like a shipwreck or an abandoned, you know, oil tanker or something. Like, yeah, are those like? Can those be positive? Are those, you know, can those be boons to an ecosystem? I mean, yeah, I guess. Provided the oil doesn't get everywhere, yeah, probably. Yeah, yeah. The the thing what? with o- abandoned oil platforms is like very sussy because they just leave them and mm-hmm. uh, there's many many potentials for like stuff to leak and come up especially during during storm events too yeah and Mm -hmm. if they're abandoned uh no one's taking responsibility for them so 
uh, it's just kind of like if somebody sees it, uh, report it kind of thing. But um, okay, so they're if they're not, yeah, if they're not doing that, yeah, there's huge biodiversity that like accumulates under those. Yeah, especially okay. like if you think of like some of the old timey like pirate style sailboats. Mm-hmm. that that yeah. have sunk you know over the you know couple hundred years you know around the caribbean yeah those make excellent reefs yeah definitely. official term pirate style sailboats <laughs> yes. i don't know i don't know what they're called i know what they're, you're talking about though <laughs> yeah um all right so let's let's sort of walk through some of the the some fun facts and stuff about some of the modern reefs that we have today so as you sort of laid out we have stuff like your coral that everybody thinks of we have some mm-hmm. bivalves that make them Mm-hmm. Some sponges, which most people probably have never even thought about other than SpongeBob. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then some weird bacteria things that are sort of not bacteria almost. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. Take us there. Okay. So, we'll start with uh, the modern coral reefs. Um, so, coral polyps is what they're called. They're mm-hmm. like the little things that kind of like branch out of like the hard part of the coral and then they like shoot back in like if uh you ever touch them Mm -hmm. um well some of them do but uh they look like a plant but they're really actually an animal um more Mm -hmm. specifically a colony of animals um they're under the phylum nidaria i'm -hmm. sorry i'm gonna butcher a lot of these uh (laughs) (laughs) i just cannot pronounce things at all but Uh, yeah um, it's it's kind of a gift. Like I know so many people, and there's like a really big dichotomy of people who work in like the life sciences where it's like either you're great at pronouncing all these weird Latin names or you're just like, I get by. Yeah. Because yeah. like looking at the word <laughs> Nidaria, you would not say that that's how that's pronounced because it starts with a C. Yeah. And it's yeah. like, what what do you even do with that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I am content not speaking during this part. <laughs> <laughs> that's Dang. okay. <laughs> All right, so the phylum Nidaria, uh, there's three uh, subsections in there, and the three are jellyfish, hydrozoans, and then coral and sea anemones are mm. their own class, and that class is anthozoa. So um, the f- cool thing about coral is that they aren't just one animal, they're right. an animal, and then also an algae, yeah? Is that Sort of. That's probably it, how most people would best understand it. It's, yeah. They're technically a group of... Um, dinoflagellates. Cell, yeah, they're a yeah. group of single-celled organisms called dinoflagellates, mm. which are crazy diverse. Like, I think we talked about them in the Paleocene, Eocene, Thermal Maximum episode. They where, sound familiar, yeah. Yeah, mm-hmm. so they're the... Both, they can do great things like living in corals, uh, and, and helping them grow. And there are also things like red tides that just kill everything in the ocean around them. Yeah. But. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, Gavin, uh, do you know how to pronounce zoo and yes. the, uh, you got to help me. <laughs> so, it was called, it was pronounced zoosantheli. Zoosantheli. Yes. Okay, cool. So, uh, how are coral reefs built, if you were wondering? Um so there's things called hermatypic corals, and they basically build reefs by depositing um, hard calcareous material for their skeleton, and um, then their uh, symbiotic other half, the, sorry, zoo, <laughs> one more time. Per- yeah. yeah, you basically just pronounce the X like another Z. <laughs> Zuzanthali? Pr- pretty much. <laughs> okay. Um, they live inside that skeleton. And uh, the cool thing is, like, they're they're mutualistic, right? So mm. the zuzanthali absorb um, the waste from the coral animals. Mm. Um, they absorb their nitrogen waste, which is what... Uh, everything animal excretes in some form. Um, For you, it's your pee. Yes. Yeah. Mike, it's your pee. (laughs) (laughs) I'm glad we've gotten to this part of the episode. (laughs) 
Yeah. Uh, and so then the algae will use those nutrients and then sunlight and carbon dioxide and make sugar uh, through photosynthesis, just like any other algae or plant. Um, and then that sugar uh, gets absorbed by the coral polyps and the corals uh, get to have a food source provided to mm -hmm. them. And uh, the algae will get the nitrogen from the coral polyps. So it's kind of like a you help me, I help you kind of thing. Um, they're... Unfortunately, there's like a lot of sensitivity in yeah. this system. So um, if it gets like too hot, the... Zooxanthellae do not like that, and they think that they're dying, so they just kind of leave. <laughs> they every leave every algae for itself. Yeah, yeah, and they just kind of leave the coral, and then that uh, turns the coral um, white, which a lot of people will know as bleaching, because mm -hmm. the algae is actually... Um, the zooxanthellae, sorry, I keep referring to it to as algae. Yeah, it's the same thing. Yeah, um, that's the part that gives the coral those, like, brilliant, like, beautiful colors. Mm -hmm. And uh, some examples that we could uh, relate to are the Great Barrier Reef, which I feel like almost everybody has heard of. It's yeah. in Australia. Um, there, I have also seen the Finding Nemo. Yes, yes, great job, great <laughs> reference, great reference. <laughs> um, there's also the Belize Barrier Reef. Um, hey, I've that, been there. Yeah, you have. Have you seen the Belize Barrier Reef? I sure have. I snorkeled wow. on it. It was great. Oh, wow. Nice. <laughs> um, there's also the Great, great Florida Reef, uh, which hence is in Florida. Um <laughs> And then one that's close to my heart is the Andros Barrier Reef, which is in the Bahamas. And okay. I have uh, snorkeled that one. Nice. Yeah. And so I actually uh, provided a link, too, um, that maybe we could share with the listeners. That, Absolutely. Um, it's from NOAA, and it shows all of the, I think, coral and uh, sponge, too. The Oh, interesting. The reefs and then like what species are on there and then you can also map of like where there's protected areas non-protected areas of in terms of uh, like preserving that area from fishing or uh, boat traffic and stuff like that okay mm -hmm. so nice yeah we'll uh, we'll make sure to put that in the show notes cool all right so but mike you have any questions about Right now? Not at the moment. Like I, you know, those words you were using were big words. I know. For the most part, but I think I have a sort of a rough idea of where things stand. Yeah. Yeah, coral cool. are are really neat because they're one of the I not the only because there are other animals that also have zooxanthellae completely unrelated. Like there are a couple different species of bivalves that have algae that do the same thing that do photosynthesis as well. Really weird. Mm -hmm. Um. But they're one of the few examples of like a truly sort of photosynthetic animal, which is just so weird. And it's like so weird that people often think that coral aren't even animals. Yeah. Yep. It is. But uh, as we've talked about, corals are not the only reefs <laughs> and also not your favorite. No, no, <laughs> they're so not let's, at all. Let, let's, let's talk about your favorite. So let's, let's get to it. My let's, favorite let's reefs. Here's some bivalves. Yes, <laughs> the bivalve reefs. Okay, they are um, in the phylum mollusca, which uh, maybe some of you have heard of the term mollusk, um, and under the class bivalvia, which uh, means bivalve. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. There's more than like 15,000 species of bivalves, including clams, oysters, mussels, scallops, uh, they're characterized by having bi, meaning two. So they have two uh, valves, is what they're called. And then they're connected at a hinge. So anything that uh, opens and closes and uh, is like two-shelled, uh, that's a bivalve. 
with and, with a small asterisk. There is another group that looks very similar but is different. Oh, which one? They're uh they're called brachiopods. Oh. They are much more common as fossils. There's like two or three species around today. Gotcha. But like 99% of the time, uh, if you see something with two shells, yeah, it is, it is a bivalve. It is a bivalve, yeah. So they bivalves ingest sediment, so they uh, are dirt eaters. Uh, most of them have evolved to have respiratory gills that um, allow for filtration. So that's the part of like the ecosystem services and functions I was talking about before that mm -hmm. uh, they filter out uh, a lot of the stuff in the water and um, they kind of deposit it down onto the, the floor, the benthic part. Okay. And uh, how they're built. So um, oysters specifically, since I know that much about them, um, they need a hard substrate to initially settle and form a reef and also to just uh, live and grow. So um, usually if there's already been oysters on a reef, they will just kind of come in and... Uh, form on top of each other and just make kind of this like giant cluster is what I like okay. to refer to them as. Um, but actually let me backtrack. So there's oysters are um, external fertilizers. So they okay. spit out their sperm and eggs, mm -hmm. hope it combines and then like they turn into little larval forms and uh, become zooplankton, which is just microscopic little animals. And um, they need to find... They basically become the thing that other bivalves are filtering out of the water. Yes. More or less, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah basically. <laughs> um, so... They are just floating around in space until they find some hard substrate to connect to. And then they can start really like growing and like getting a shell and hardening and doing their thing. Um, so a lot of um, conservation and development in the coast right now is uh, working on trying to rebuild some of the reefs. So they're like throwing out uh, the cement that Gavin had mentioned before um, in hopes that bivalves will come and just settle on those because they're a hard substrate. Um, so yeah, the some examples of those are oyster reefs and mussel reefs. Uh, most other bivalves don't really form true reefs. Uh, they're more like they hang out on other reefs. So like coral reefs will have like the giant clams and uh, Oyster reefs will have mm. ribbed mussels on them, too. Okay. Um, so the specific categories of reefs can be, like, it's a lot messier than just a specific category. Is that right? Yeah, definitely. I okay. would say so. Because yeah. if you think about a coral reef, like, everything that's on there isn't just coral, you know? Mm -hmm. And same with the oyster reefs, too. And even even within a coral reef, and maybe this is the same with oyster reefs, I'm, I'm not really sure, but it's usually several different species of coral that mm, make up yeah. the reef. Yeah. And even, even there's lots of different species of coral that don't form hard parts. There, yep. There's lots of different species. Oh, yeah. Um, so are oyster reefs sort of like that? Like, are there multiple species of oyster that can form a single reef? Like, does that happen? Um, no, not really. Okay. So uh, there's really only two main oysters in the U.S. area. Um, there's the uh, eastern oyster, which is all on the east coast. Mm -hmm. And then there's like the Pacific oyster, which is on the gotcha. Pacific coast. But uh, the eastern oyster is what's in the Gulf, um, where I am in and uh, it's pretty much all just the same species. Okay. Yeah. 
Um, so next we have algal reefs or sh- and or stromatolite reefs. <laughs> we we is... will talk about these much more once yeah. we get to sort of the paleo, you know, ancient perspective, but yeah. Um, I'm definitely, this was the weakest spot. I knew nothing about this before coming into uh, this talk. I was like, oh boy, what am I going to (laughs) do? So from what I got out of my research was for this episode, um, is that there are calcareous mounds of uh, lime secreting cyanobacteria, and they basically trap sediments into calcium carbonate and then form mounds of limestone? More or less. Yeah. So uh, they build sediment on top of each other. Yes. Uh, The only thing I found that's still, like, alive today is lagoons in Australia. Yeah. So there's only, like, two or three places in the world that they form, and really only one Mm. that they form something that you could call a reef. Gotcha. Gotcha. And that would be, I, I think it's on sort of like the south, like southwest, maybe southeastern side of Australia. Yeah. Cool. But so that sort of brings us to our last sort of main example. I'm sure that there are some that are like technically a thing today, but these are some of the only like real prevalent ones. So what, yeah. let's let's bring it to our last one before we go back in time. Yes. So, uh my boss and uh, PI would uh, be very bitter if I didn't mention <laughs> the glass sponge reefs because uh, she did her postdoc in British Columbia on okay. uh, glass sponge reefs. Um, and she's just a huge sponge sponge scientist. So I'd love to talk to them because, like, why? <laughs> yeah, uh, they're cool. <laughs> um I've been working on a couple projects with her that uh, we're looking at um, some of the effects that sponges have on ecosystems, and it's and it's crazy what they can do to uh, the community around them. Hmm. So, so all of these kinds of reefs are around today, because you mentioned we're going to go back in time yeah. in a little bit, yes. Gavin. So all the ones that have been mentioned up to this point are ones that you can go somewhere in the world and find them. Yeah. Okay. So a glass sponge, real quick, is um, there are reefs formed by hexatinolid sponges, which um, they make their their skeleton out of silica. Which Which is glass. Yeah. (laughs) It's glass. (laughs) Which literally is glass. Like that is the things, the stuff that your windows are made out of. Yep. Yep. Um, I believe that there's only one true glass sponge reef and that is in, or like multiple, but only in the realm of like the coast of British Columbia. Okay. And um, you can find like individual glass sponges like across the world, mm-hmm. but the true uh, reefs that were thought to have gone extinct about like 40 million years ago, uh, they actually found a true reef um, in 1987 in British Columbia. Yeah. Interesting. Because yep. we will definitely talk about some sponge reefs in the past, but I, I didn't think that there were any sort of like entirely gl- like sponge reefs around today. So that's really neat. Yeah. Yeah. And there's like reef is used so loosely yeah, in, sure. <laughs> in modern biology like we call like a lot of sponge reefs like in the bahamas reefs even though they're actually like fe- sponge beds okay but um yeah reef is like kind of been modified to really just be like this uh structural kind of thing in modern biology yeah like there's there's no cutoff saying it's like okay if it's you know, above, you know, 10 centimeters off yep. of the rest of the seafloor, then it's a reef. There's no cutoff yeah. for that. So it's like, yeah. technically, uh, where you does know, it? Where knows does it when it? she sees it. Exactly. <laughs> That's definitely a reef. <laughs> so uh, do you have anything else that you want to add about modern reefs? No, um, just I love oyster reefs and i love talking about oyster reefs so if you have any questions or ever wonder anything about them 
uh, please ask me and I will talk your ear off about them. <laughs> Absolutely. So I'm ready to hear, hear it, Gavin. Wreaths, as you probably can imagine, uh, have been very common throughout uh, all of Earth's history because, you know, life started in the ocean and the foundations of them are typically relatively simple animals. And the, the relatively simple animals that we have around today were some of the first ones to really show up. Mm -hmm. um, so reefs, technically, because we said it can literally just be a pile of stuff in the ocean, have been basically around as long as there has been ocean. But the first, you know, so for over 4 billion years, realistically, but the first, like, biologically formed reefs, we kind of start seeing them around 3.5 billion years ago with, you know, with a B. Um, and those wow. would be those stromatolites, the, the algal reefs, which are interesting because they are some of the ver very first fossils that we have, period, uh, are, are stromatolites. And so they hmm. basically form from like an algal mat. So they are single-celled, or you can arguably call them colonial, um, photosynthetic algae that as they do photosynthesis, they sort of change the chemistry in the water around them. And like a, they, like you said, they trap sediment, you know, sand and uh, other kinds of sediment just in the water, just because they're kind of sticky. Mm -hmm. So they'll trap sediment that way. But then they also, the, the way they do photosynthesis and the way they just sort of the way their metabolism works, uh, change the water chemistry to cause calcium carbonate to precipitate out of the water because ocean water just naturally has calcium carbonate dissolved in it. That's how anything that makes a shell out of it, you know, yeah. that's where they get it from. Uh, Everything so, that like, ha like shell is calcium carbonate. Like with, shell. There, there's a couple of exceptions. Yeah. Uh, there's always exceptions with everything, but it's yeah. like technically if you call like um, arthropods, exoskeletons, their shell, that's not calcium carbonate, but th things mm -hmm. like, bivalves things like um the chambered nautilus you know yeah. um most things with a shell or a hard skeleton uh, in the ocean forms it from calcium carbonate um so they they do that and then they sort of bury themselves in this sediment so then they have to sort of move up a bit you know on top of that sediment that they trapped and formed and they they keep doing that and they form these big mounds um, so those technically are reefs because they are having to stay up. You know, if, if sea levels rise, they have to keep rising with it off of the seafloor so they can keep doing photosynthesis. And, uh, if sea level, you know, falls or, or they end up just building themselves up out of the water, they die because they need water. Um, uh, especially back then because there wasn't any ozone in the atmosphere to protect them from, uh, radiation. <laughs> so, uh, as soon as they got out of the water, they all just died. <laughs> So uh, those were the first reefs, were these stromatolites. And they were basically by themselves doing this thing for basically three billion years. That's a significantly long period of time. That is a huge like, period of time. Even by yeah. the standards of this podcast, that's a significantly long period of Absolutely. time. Absolutely. Yep. So, but the first multicellular reefs come around sort of in the Cambrian period, which... Arguably, there's, there's always a big asterisk for, like, the first time something shows up to it's like, was it around beforehand and it just didn't preserve as a fossil? Maybe. I can't say for sure that it didn't. So, yep. uh, <sighs> but these were a group of uh, animals called archaeocyathids. Hmm. So, they show up in the Cambrian period, uh, early-ish Cambrian period, so around 528 or so million years ago. And they're these weird animals that look sort of basically just like a, a tube that sort of comes to like a point at the bottom and then flattens out. So imagine sort of like a rocket where the pointy part is facing down, but you have like a big flat pedestal to sit it on so it doesn't fall over. Why would they go to a point? I feel like that's structurally unstable. It's, it's mostly, I mean, it probably is. And, you know. <laughs> Maybe that's why they're not around anymore. <laughs> um, 
so they sort of form this like funnel-y type shape. And we used to think that these were sort of like the precursors to coral. I don't particularly okay. know why we thought that because they very much look like a sponge. And that's kind of what we think now is that they were just a kind of odd sponge. Yep. I uh, just Googled what they look like and definitely they look very sponge spongy. vibes. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, at the time, you know, everything looked weird because it was the first time that multicellular life really became popular. Mm -hmm. So everything just looked weird. Um, so they kind of peter out. They, they're only around for about 20 million years, but they were the first things to sort of really build up a significant structure off of, you know, the seabed. And so they might make it to the end of the Cambrian period around 485 million years ago, but Dep that depends on who he asks. The evidence for that's a little controversial. Most people agree they disappeared by like 500-ish million years ago. And then basically when they went extinct, reef building was mainly only done by those stromatolites again. So they kind of took back the reef throne. Um, and then once we get from the Cambrian period to the Ornovician period... Uh, again, around 485 or so million years ago, we get a really interesting different group of sponges called stromatoporoids. And they are called stromatoporoids, you know, because they look very much like stromatolites. Uh, they so form the, the difference uh, is that these are sponges and we can actually see a skeleton type structure there. Whereas with uh, stromatolites, it's just like layers of, Algae, essentially. Okay. Uh, but these are interesting sponges that they... F it, it's not because they form in the same way. They just happen to preserve in a way that makes them look similar to stromatolites. Mm. But just another group of sponges that show up, not even for all that long, but they sort of take back over from uh, the stromatolites uh, again. And it's also sort of around this time, the early Ordovician period, uh, again, around 480, perhaps, uh, million years ago, that corals start to become a lot more common and start doing reef things because corals had been around, but they weren't really doing reef things yet. Uh, but they're not the same corals that we have today. So mainly we had two groups of corals that are called tabulate corals and rugosin corals. Tabulate corals are a lot more sort of encrusting, you know, whereas things like a lot of our modern corals today will sort of build up and out a little bit. These just sort of build out without as much of the building up off of the seafloor. Uh, so those are the tabulate corals. And then rugosin corals are very, very famous fossils, um, particularly the solitary ones, because uh, even a lot of corals today are not all colonial and form reef structures that you think of when you think of coral. So... I don't even think it's most, but it's just the most common because they're much bigger. Uh, rugosin corals actually form a shape that looks sort of like a cow's horn. And they're frequently called horn corals. Um, so if, if you look up horn coral, you've yeah. probably seen it at least somewhere on the internet. Very frequently, we will get people sending... Basically, every paleontologist will get like an email or like a Twitter DM or something being like, Hey, I think I found like a dinosaur claw or, or a tooth or something. And it's, it does look like a tooth. <laughs> right. And it's like, so, no, it's, it's a really neat fossil, but it's, it's a coral, not, uh, not a vertebrate. Uh, Reminds me of that scene of holes when, when they, for, when he first mm -hmm. finds like the lipstick tube, like, isn't this something cool? It's like, <laughs> not for what, not what we're looking for. <laughs> right. I think he actually finds a fossil. Yeah. In, he does. In that yeah. Scenario. yeah. Yep. Um, he's like, well, that's he finds the what... fossil first, yeah. and then he finds the lipstick yeah. tube. That's right. I had it reversed. Yeah. Um, but what's lipstick really is interesting... obviously more important. Oh, of course. <laughs> um, but what's really interesting about these corals is that at this point, we're fairly sure that these types of corals did not have their zooxanthellae. You know, the the symbiotic algae that lives within them. Uh, it's we're we're pretty sure just based on like their growth rates. And, and also where you find them, like the sediment that you find them around indicates a deeper water than you might be able to find with, you know, if, if they needed the zooxanthellae to do photosynthesis. So it's really interesting that we had corals 
but doing completely weird choral things than you think of today. Gavin, uh, are there any hypotheses that you know of of what they were eating at that time if they weren't getting their food from the Zosanteli? Well, so corals today do actually eat too. Okay, that's true. Um, so what they do is they mostly eat at night and then photosynthesize during the day. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's likely that they, I don't know if the oceans were just more productive or if they, their metabolism was just slower so they needed less energy. Gotcha. So that's probably what it was. Um, but again, just based on their, their growth rate and their rate of new skeleton growth, um, we're pretty sure that they didn't have them. Mm-hmm. So at this point, it is mostly some, some sponge things, some corals building reefs, and it kind of chills that way for like, I don't know, 250 million years or so. There's no real, obviously the, the species change, you know, that's a lot of time for things to be quote unquote the same. The amount of species change, you know, I'm sure it sort of shifted to being more sponge dominated, more coral dominated at different points, but it doesn't significantly really change until we get to around 230, uh, or I'm sorry, 250 million years ago or so. And this takes us to the end of the Permian period, which we've talked about a good few times on this podcast. This is the time when everything died. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> um so yeah at the Wings end of the permian the period, ceiling yeah <laughs> music starts playing exactly you nice know you, you get dog. you get the super mario you know like a, a minute left music where it's like dun, 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 dun. everything <laughs> just gets really fast and really anxious uh so yeah 251 <laughs> million years ago uh especially in the oceans like at least 95 potentially up to like 98% of all species went extinct. And uh, corals were no exception. Corals did real, real bad during this time to the point where like we almost lost corals altogether. Wow. Um, So those two groups of corals that I mentioned earlier, the tabulate corals and the rugosan corals, they go completely extinct. Those are gone. And so one thing that I feel like will never, ever go extinct because they're just so resilient are those photosynthetic bacteria. And just because there's so many different varieties of them, they take back over in the immediate aftermath of this extinction. Um, And then it kind of comes back to corals and sponges a bit in the Triassic period right afterward. And this is the first time that we see the modern corals around today. So the modern corals that build reefs are sort of a subgroup of corals because corals don't all build reefs even today, uh, but they're the scleractinian corals, the stony corals is, is what you might hear those called. So they mm-hmm. first show up uh, about 20 million or so years after the extinction, maybe a little less than that, but a little bit after the extinction. And then don't really start building reefs until about 25 million years after the first time that we see them. Uh, so they take a while to show up and then also take a while to get going. And then at the beginning, it's also pretty likely that they didn't have the zoosanthelae either. Because that is a really big point of contention for like prehistoric coral researchers. It's like, when did this actually happen? Hmm. Because again, based on growth rates, it, it's kind of difficult to tell whether they did or did not. So... The Triassic period is weird because it both starts and ends in a mass extinction. <laughs> so they had another mass extinction there. <laughs> and More they didn't balloons. do great. They did better than they did in the end Permian. But so, you know, everything did. Uh, this one was not nearly as bad. It was still bad, but not as bad. Um, but they actually bounce back relatively quickly and then do pretty well throughout the Jurassic period. Uh, but toward the end of the Jurassic period, a new rival appears for forming reefs. And this is, to my knowledge, from everything I could find for my research for this episode, this is the first time that bivalves start building reefs. Yahoo! But this is not a group that we have around today. Oh. This is a group called the rudest bivalves. 
that are not really so oysters are sort of like they almost look like sort of a cornucopia almost right like am i am i picturing that right um i'm not really sure what a cornucopia is no oh. <laughs> like <laughs> so, sort of like a horn shape where it's like flat and then like one of the valves is like elongated and relatively flat and then one is kind of like a lid uh no they're both kind of like uh I mean, I guess it depends on how uh, they, how and where they're able to grow because oh, interesting. they can have a flat side, but also both sides can be uh, rounded. Oh. Um, yeah, it's really more of like um, opportunistic of how okay. they're, I mean, I guess like in only in the, in the species that I work with, okay. I can't really speak for the other ones. Okay. Um, well, these guys do it weird. Because, so when they first show up, they look more like you think of with, like, a, a bivalve, where the two valves are relatively the same. But then as they go on, uh, one valve turns into basically a cone, mm-hmm. and the other one turns into, like, a manhole cover. <laughs> and it's basically just completely flat and circular. Interesting. And so they cement to each other with the bottom part of the cone and build reefs up that way. Uh, really interesting. They start off, like I said, much more normal bivalve E, but they, they build reefs like this throughout, you know, the late part of the Jurassic and then basically all of the Cretaceous period. So most of the time when dinosaurs were around, these guys are the major reef builders instead of corals or sponges, you know, which is really weird that for a while, the major uh, reef builders on the planet, essentially, at least from what I could find, Coral reefs were still around, but they were not as commonplace, I guess, as these rudest bivalve uh, reefs. And they do super hmm. well for like a um, hundred million years, so they had a really good run. Uh, but weirdly, they kind of die out basically right before the extinction. They don't even make it to the end Cretaceous extinction. So the asteroid did not do them in, which is interesting. And I think there's a lot of contention about what actually made these guys go extinct because I don't think we actually know. Yep. Um, Are there any hypotheses? Probably not that I was able to really find. I also, to be fair, didn't look super hard. Um, Um, A thought that crosses my mind um, in the reefs, the oyster reefs that I work with now, uh, they're really susceptible to parasites. And... um, because they need brackish water, which is like a mix of salt okay. and fresh water. Mm-hmm. Uh, in one aspect, uh, I can't recall off the top of my head, but either the fresh water input or the salt water input will kill off the parasite. And then like uh, they'll bounce back depending on the levels of salinity in the water. So um, interesting. maybe that could be a thought that could have wiped them out was just a parasite. Interesting. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Um, Don't quote yeah, me so, on it. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I mean, so that's really interesting because, like, that's something that has been brought up about many different groups going extinct, but it's like that's something that's almost impossible to actually test. Right. You know, right. so that's a hypothesis yeah. that there's no way to actually test. Mm-hmm. It's like f- for many mass extinctions, there's been like a proposed like gamma ray burst from somewhere, some random place in space. And it's like, cool there's no way for me to refute that and say that that didn't happen but there's also right which makes bad science (laughs) yeah (laughs) not not necessarily bad science but it's like if you're trying to pass that off as like hey this is for sure the reason that these particular bivalves went extinct and it's like okay maybe you should go on sabbatical for a little while um (laughs) so after the rudis go extinct, the corals kind of take back over. Then, once again, there's another mass extinctions that corals, once again, do not do well. Um, but they also bounce back relatively quickly as the main reef builders uh, after the end Cretaceous mass extinction. And they pretty much continue that way until today. Um, but as I sort of mentioned a couple times, I was not able to find anywhere a solid answer for when exactly modern corals got their zoosanthalli, 
and I actually saw several things that said, so we, I've sort of explained how different groupings in biology work. So the group, the type of grouping that we really like in particularly like phylogenetics, you know, how different things are related are monophyletic groups, you know, a group that is, you know, an, an animal and all of its descendants. So, um, we kind of, I, I read papers suggesting both that zooxanthellae is and is not like a defining characteristic of some groups of coral, like that it is a monophyletic trait and that it is not because there are certain families of coral where members have zooxanthellae and members don't. Hmm. And it's also weird because basically every species of coral that has them it's, it's not like it's all the same species of algae across all corals. Each species has like its own unique species of algae that lives within it. So it's really hard to even track that, you know, the genetics of the algae. So it's, it's makes it really interesting to, to try and do that way. So either the corals gained it once and lost it a whole bunch of times or gained it a whole bunch of times independently which is real weird. Um, based on my understanding of evolution, I would bet that they gained it once and then lost it a whole bunch of times, similar to how like <laughs> birds gained flight once and then lost it a whole bunch of times. Yeah, yeah. That would be my guess, but I also barely understand coral, so. Yeah, the <laughs> same. Um, um, a, a terrestrial thing that kind of comes to mind when like, you're talking about uh, these different like mutualistic things that mm -hmm. they have different species and different things is lichens. Lichens are yeah. um, like a mutualistic thing of like algae or cyanobacteria and then a fungi, but like mm -hmm. the species are always different. The structure is always different. So it's always like hard to really give classifications for those. And yeah, for I sure. guess that's just like, I thought about that while you're talking about that. No, that's, that's a really good comparison. Um, mm -hmm. imagine, I'm sure at some point there probably was like giant, I mean, for the time, giant forests of nothing but lichen before like plants really existed. Yeah. What a world. <laughs> um, that would be cool. That would be cool. But that, like I said, that kind of brings us up to today, which we've already talked about. Um, yeah. So that's, that's my very brief whirlwind. I'm positive that we have missed something at some point in here. Oh, yeah. um, because reefs in general, like corals by themselves could be an entire, not like, not even an entire episode, like an entire whole podcast. There probably could, are. Right. Many. I'm pretty sure there's probably one dedicated just to corals. Um, and if not, someone should start one. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm positive that we missed something. Um, oh, yeah. So if we didn't talk about your particular favorite reef builder, I'm sorry. Please tweet at me. Um, <laughs> I need the engagement. I want to grow my Twitter. Uh, oh, uh, <laughs> can we plug me too? Absolutely. We will put Fia's Fia, Twitter. You can do whatever you in. want. Exactly. <laughs> I just recently, uh, probably about a month ago, made a Twitter because I was like, apparently uh, Twitter is the thing for scientific communication. Science and Twitter is very fun. It's, it's, it is fun. I'm having a lot of fun with it. Absolutely. Um, so where, uh, where can the people so what's find your Twitter? You? Um, it's Finn underscore Ella. Okay. Can you spell that for the, uh, for the <laughs> masses? Capital F I N or capital F and then lowercase I N underscore E L L A. Yeah. We'll make sure we'll link that in the description. You know Absolutely. What? I, yeah. And then I Mike, think... maybe you could edit something in at the beginning as well. Being like, Hey, she doesn't mention this till the end, but follow her. Honestly, I'm not really confident. Sure. I lied. <laughs> 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 so it, it is Finn underscore Ella, but with one at the end. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah. You, so, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. If, if you Andy could King, edit you something earlier. Vanilla. Yes, f the, the first Vanilla. I was number one. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, yeah, so... Thank you for joining us, Fia. This was wonderful. We love Thank having you guests on, so especially much. especially when it's one of our bestest friends. So yeah, 
Um, yeah. We appreciate you so much. Number one fan of the pod. Yeah. Thank um, you so much for having me. I've really been wanting to do this for a long time, and I just can't believe it's actually happened. And, <laughs> and it's done. We're done, and we did it, and now it's a thing. Absolutely. So thank you for coming on. Thank you, listeners, for uh, sitting through this roughly hour with us learning about some of the most bizarre and diverse ecosystems on the planet Mm -hmm. that we almost assuredly did not do great justice. But now you know a little more about reefs. Yeah, we have a nice start. So you all know a little more about reefs and a little more about our good friend Fia. So thank you all for listening. Thank you. Thank you to all of our guests from FIA as well as our two guests last week. I think next week is going to be a standard yes. just a duet between me and Gavin. I mean, I don't have any I don't have anything lined up. So <laughs> if we do, it's a surprise to me at this point too. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you thank you for uh, for making this a uh, an extra fun episode, FIA. I know I didn't have a whole lot to say on this one because <laughs> you guys you guys kind of had it covered. I didn't have a whole lot I wanted to add. <laughs> On, uh, on this one. But thank you, everybody, for listening to episode 34 of I Wish You Were Dead, a podcast about things that used to be alive. We will be back next Wednesday with something. <laughs>